it's been a big challenge for me as a mom to realize that like my parenting is not going to look how I always want it to look. And for me, this is a big point of insecurity because I want to be a great mom for my kids. I want them to have open communication with me. I want them to trust me. I want them to know that I love them and that I prioritize them and that I'll be there for them. And sometimes I feel like I fall short of the mark, right? Yesterday is a great example. I worked uh, 10 hours straight. I had 10 straight hours of calls. I had no breaks. This is between my corporate job and running my business. And when I was done, all I wanted in life was to like sit on the couch, eat takeout Chinese, and read a book. Like I needed to decompress because that's a really long day for somebody who's introverted to spend that much time talking. And my daughter came to me and was like, Hey, I really want to play princess. Will you help me build a castle? And I said, no. And I look back and this is a struggle for me because of course I want to build a castle with her. Of course I want to do the things she wants to do. But in that moment, I was so exhausted from all of these other pressures that I had put on myself that I did not feel capable of doing that in a way that was going to serve her well. I was going to get frustrated. I was going to be annoyed. I was going to be short with her. And I don't want to come off that way either. And it's a struggle for me. I think for a lot of working moms, we work all day and then we come home and we want to be present for our kids. But sometimes that's just not it's not feasible. Welcome back to Secrets of a Corporate Game. So many people are trying to navigate a corporate world that is laden with secrets, cleverly hidden and unspoken rules to a game that most employees don't even know they're playing. On this podcast, we try to give you a peek behind the curtain and unveil some of those secrets with tips and tricks that you can apply today to start taking control of your career and progress up the ladder faster. Welcome back, all of my favorite people. Thanks for tuning in today. We have a special Mother's Day edition of the podcast where I am going to be talking about not just all of the amazing things that it can be to be a mother in the workforce, but also a lot of the challenges that we may face um, as I feel like it can be challenging (laughs) in certain ways when you are trying to balance a family life, being in the workplace, and in my case, also being an entrepreneur. So today, We're going to jump in and talk a little bit about motherhood and the corporate world. So for me, there are a few things that I think have been really interesting in my personal journey as a mom who works a full-time job and owns a business. I want to preface everything that this episode is going to talk about by saying that I am not representative of all women and all of their feelings and all of their experiences. Okay, there are so many nuances to what it is like to work a unique experience to who you are, whether that's your age, your gender, your sexual orientation, your religion, your parenting style, et cetera. Um, But I am going to talk a little bit about my personal experience, what it's been like on my journey, how I balance things, what that looks like, um, and then some of the negativity that comes with that as well. So to start, I will say that I have always been incredibly career-driven. All right, my number one priority, especially in my younger years, was always my career, growing quickly, developing quickly, progressing quickly up the ladder, um, and doing this in a way that I felt really proud of. And I will say that I, early on, very quickly fell into the trap of my career really becoming my identity. All right, I felt really strongly that how I performed at work, what I was able to deliver, what people thought of me in the workplace was very representative of who I was as a person. And it has taken decades for me to break that habit. And I still struggle with it. It is still a constant struggle for me to feel as though I am enough, even if I don't work a corporate job. I am enough, even if I don't hold a certain seniority title. I am enough, even if I'm a business owner or if I'm not owning a business. And I think the most recent example of this for me is that it was very challenging when I became a career coach, when I started my own business, for me to stop referring to myself by my corporate title, right? I am the IT director of planning, execution, and strategy for a financial services company. And I'm very proud of it, right? It was a lot of lessons learned. I worked really, really hard. I made tons of mistakes. 
And so I'm incredibly proud of the ability that I've been able to build this career. And I think that the stigma difference between, hey, I'm a director in financial services and I'm a career coach existed in my mind. And I'm not saying being a career coach is not incredibly important. I'm not saying it doesn't add a ton of value. I'm not saying that it is not like the sole purpose for my being now. That's not true, but you get what I'm saying. But I felt like it was less impressive on paper than my corporate title. And it's been a big challenge for me because my corporate identity was wrapped up so much of my personal identity. And so I think a big challenge that a lot of women have, men as well, but in a different way, is that because we spend so much time at work, so much of what we do becomes who we think we are. And identifying who we are separate from our titles, separate from the work that we accomplish, is so important to our overall satisfaction and well-being. You cannot be dependent on your company and performance in your job for your happiness. And so some of the things that I've started doing that I often encourage to clients as well who are struggling with this same thing is one, to start journaling. I am not a journaler. I don't like it. (laughs) For me to look at a blank piece of paper and be like, oh, I'm going to write down all of my thoughts. And it, my brain does not work that way. I'm way too structured. So if you're like that and you're like, I am not going to start journaling, here's the template that I use that I think is really, really helpful. Um, and I got this from Emma Watson, actually. I think she does this and it resonated so deeply with me. So every day I write down nine things. I write down three things that I did well the day before. This will be hard. A lot of women, men too, have a hard time looking at ourselves and saying, I did well, right? So three things that I did well yesterday, three things that I'm grateful for that bring joy to my life, and then three nice things that I either did for someone else or someone else did for me. And I found that going through this practice every day has helped me really feel much more satisfaction in the work that I'm doing, because even if yesterday was a bad day, even if something went wrong, sitting there in the stillness and coming up with these things I'm thankful for, these nice things that I did or that somebody did for me, and these things I did well helps reset my brain to focus on that positivity rather than getting stuck in that spiral that like, I am my job, my job didn't go well, therefore I am not what I need to be. It helps me think more well-rounded. So I highly encourage building a journaling practice for you that might look like this. It may also just be a brain dump. It might be a diary entry of what happened that day. You do you, boo. The second thing is to understand what are your priorities and your hobbies outside of work. I ask so many people, I think maybe this is millennials because we're into like granny hobbies, (laughs) but people are like, I don't know. I eat and I go shopping. (laughs) which don't get me wrong. I love to eat and shop. I would say eating is my love language. So don't get me wrong there. But what are the hobbies that really give you peace and time for yourself? So for me, I've recently started coloring again, would not say I'm big into coloring, but I've been trying to tap into my more feminine energy, let go of my need to control things and really be able to sit in stillness, which are things that are very, very uncomfortable for me personally. And coloring outside in the sunlight has been a great way for me to kind of shut my brain off and get to decompress. Some would say it's meditative. So for me, I do coloring. I garden in the summer. Um, I live in Colorado. There's a very short growing season, but I love it. And I will grow as much as I possibly can. In fact, my garlic is coming in right now, which is like really, really exciting. (laughs) So I garden. That's like my peaceful outdoor time in the soil, creating something, getting to be proud of my accomplishments outside of work. And then obviously I am a mother and a spouse. And spending time with my family and loving on my family is really, really important to me. Now, the flip side of this, once you found your identity outside of work, uh, I'm pretty hard on myself. I think a lot of women are. I fall into that insecurity of not feeling enough all the time. And I had a good reminder from a client that I spoke with today. She said that me saying that I had imposter syndrome made her feel so much better (laughs) that she had imposter syndrome. And I think it's easy as coaches, as mentors, as guides for us to fall into this trap of like, we don't want to admit our weaknesses. We want to be strong. We want to feel like we have all the answers. We always know what to do. And this is going to be an uncomfortable episode for me because I'm going to share all of the things I don't know, right? I'm going to share the fact that all the time, I feel like I am not a good enough mom all the time. Uh, I'm not naturally very like warm and nurturing. I 
am very logical and tactical and I think about doing things in a certain order. So I don't, I don't play very well. I'm not that mom who sits on the floor and builds blocks with her kids. I just, I'm not wired that way. And it's been a big challenge for me as a mom to realize that like my parenting is not going to look how I always want it to look. And for me, this is a big point of insecurity because I want to be a great mom for my kids. I want them to have open communication with me. I want them to trust me. I want them to know that I love them and that I prioritize them and that I'll be there for them. And sometimes I feel like I fall short of the mark, right? Yesterday is a great example. I worked uh, 10 hours straight. I had 10 straight hours of calls. I had no breaks. This is between my corporate job and running my business. And when I was done, all I wanted in life was to like sit on the couch eat takeout Chinese and read a book. Like I needed to decompress because that's a really long day for somebody who's introverted to spend that much time talking. And my daughter came to me and was like, Hey, I really want to play princess. Will you help me build a castle? And I said, no. And I look back and this is a struggle for me because of course I want to build a castle with her. Of course I want to do the things she wants to do. But in that moment, I was so exhausted from all of these other pressures that I had put on myself that I did not feel capable of doing that in a way that was going to serve her well. I was going to get frustrated. I was going to be annoyed. I was going to be short with her. And I don't want to come off that way either. And it's a struggle for me. I think for a lot of working moms, we work all day and then we come home and we want to be present for our kids. But sometimes that's just not it's not feasible, at least for me personally. And I'd be interested to hear what people have to say in the comments. But for me, this is a struggle. Now, are my kids always bathed and fed and clothed? And we always digest how the day was at school after school. When we do our homework together, we talk about what they liked, what they didn't like, who they played with, what they're struggling with. Do we have open communication? Absolutely. Do they feel the love for them when on their birthdays, they get cinnamon rolls with birthday candles in them for breakfast and birthday cakes at night and beautiful birthday parties. I try to do as much as I can to provide for my kids, but I feel like there are plenty of times where as a working mom, I don't feel present enough. I struggle to not be too logical in my engagements with my children, right? And so this feeds in to my frustrations with work, right? I don't want to work all day and then not be present to my kids, but I work a corporate job and I own a business and I feel like I have all these things I need to do. And, you know, I see all these great people post on social media and they're like, I work three hours a day running my business. And the rest of the time I dedicate to my family. And I think that's amazing. That's great. I'm not wired that way. Like, even if I had the ability to scale back my hours to three hours a day, I don't think I could bring myself to do it. Now, could I scale back to six hours a day and be a lot more present for my family? Yeah, that probably makes more sense for me. But I think I have a very high threshold for stress and for activities and for demands and for priorities. And the idea of scaling back all that way and just being present for my family would be really hard for me too. So if you're, you know, thinking about being a stay-at-home mom and that's been on your heart, I think that's amazing. And I think that you should definitely, if it's, you know, a financial option for you guys, go for that. But for me, I know myself, if I became a stay-at-home mom, then I would just fill my calendar with other stuff I have to do. I'd be on... PTA and I'd be teaching fitness classes for fun and I'd be going to the gym and I'd be doing a book club. Like I know myself, like I can't sit still. And so this is like a big insecurity of mine. And I think for all the moms out there who are juggling both, you're doing okay. Like you are enough. You are making it work. And while we will all probably fight with our children at some point, that seems to be a thing. They will look back and they will appreciate you. They will know the effort that you put forth for them to be able to do the things that they did and that you loved them through it. And this is something that I have to tell myself all the time because I worry that my kids will look at other moms and think, oh, there's, they play with their kids so much or they're so involved, but there are trade-offs because I do get the financial stability that comes with working my jobs. I do have the ability to take us on cool vacations and go to cool places. And so, um, I think if this is a struggle for anybody who's listening, you know, in honor of all the moms out there who are hustling to make breakfast and get the kids on the bus and to get them off to school and then start your work day and work all day and then make dinner and then take them to gymnastics and taekwondo and hockey and 
t-ball and all the things and then put them down for bed. If you're feeling like you're not enough, it's okay. You are. And this is something that I struggle with all the time. So this episode is just as much for me as it is for you. And I think that on Mother's Day, I always joke with my friends, like the one thing I want on Mother's Day is to like not have to mother. Like, <laughs> I want to sleep in bed late. I want somebody to make me breakfast. I want to go to the spa. Like I want to do all the things that I don't normally prioritize because I need that break too. And so it is also okay to prioritize yourself. Something that I used to do a lot more often before I started my business was like one Friday a quarter, I would take the day off work and do like a mom staycation. So while the kids are at school, I would go to the spa, I'd get my hair done, I'd get my nails done, I'd go work out, I would go lay by the pool, like whatever the things are that you want to do to have that day for yourself or do it with your spouse and get that one-on-one time. So um, I know I've gone off a little bit on a tangent here, but I do think it's just so, it's so challenging to be a mom and to work. We have the issue of our identity being wrapped in our job. Then we have the feeling of never being enough for all the different directions that we're being pulled in. And I think that that can be a real challenge. I think the other side of this. And I have a good friend, Masha. I will tag her in the comments as well. If you want to check out some of her content, she's been doing a lot of research lately on the impacts of motherhood in career progression and in income. And when we have children, we take time off work generally. Okay. In the U S it's kind of touch and go, but we take a maternity leave. And in a lot of ways that can slow down our progression. And I'm not saying that's right. I'm not saying it's okay, but we are taking that time. And then then when we come back, we want to log off at 3.30 to get our kids from the bus, or we want to leave to pick up our kids from daycare on time. And I can tell you before I had children, I was a workaholic. You want me there at 6am? No problem. You want me to stay till nine o'clock at night? No problem. You want me to log in on the weekend to get some stuff done? Sure. Like I did all these above and beyond things. And I'm not saying you should be going and doing those. Okay. Those are what burn you out or they're a contributing factor. But I was so married and dedicated to my job and to my growth that the way I showed up at work was very different than the way I did post kids. And I remember before I had my first kid, I met with a mentor of mine. I've mentioned her on other episodes uh, where she gave me guidance about like how to communicate more effectively and lead meetings more effectively. Um, But I went to her and I was like, I'm so afraid to have this baby because I love my career so much. What if it slows down my progression? And some of you moms listening to this are probably like, that is ridiculous. That is not what you should be worried about. Fair enough. But there are probably some people who empathize with that. I've had plenty of clients tell me like, hey, I'm worried to have a baby. What if I don't get promoted? I'm worried to have this kid. What if I can't work the hours I was working before? What if things are too demanding? What if I'm not present enough for my kid because of my job, right? There's all these worries that come with that transition. And I remember she kind of laughed and she looked at me and she said, I'll be interested to see when you come back from maternity leave, if you care at all about your progression. Be interesting. She said, because there's nothing wrong with caring about your progression post kids. It's great to have aspirations and goals and things you want to achieve. And she said, but for me personally, I care so much less now about my corporate success because I have other more important things in my life. And at the time I was like, well, that's not going to be me. Okay. (laughs) My job is my most important thing. This is what my whole life is based in. This is my whole identity, right? Going back to that identity piece. And I was so nervous of the career impact. And what I will say is even though I'm not particularly nurturing and I'm not particularly like the cuddle and play kind of mom, it is so much easier to care less about my career now that I have kids. (laughs) Because in the end, I'm like, am I paying the bills? Great. Do they get to go take Taekwondo? Great. Can I log off when I need to for emergencies? Great. Those are really my only priorities because the career does, it is a way to supply the things we need. It is not who you are. And so I think once I had kids, that became much more apparent to me. I had other things. I had my spouse who the the caveat to this entire episode and to everything that I do is that none of what I do would be possible without the incredible support of my partner. Okay. He takes the kids to the bus stop. He gets the kids from the bus stop. He takes them to 
um, acting on Thursdays when I take clients. He makes sure that there's always somebody in parent-teacher conferences if it's during a call that I can't miss. Like he is so involved and so supportive and none of what I do would be possible if I didn't have that support system. And we'll talk about support systems in just a minute. But the caveat to this whole episode is it's a lot easier to do these things when you have a husband who's super, super amazing. Back to my story though. I have my kid and I went back to work. Uh, By the way, when I returned from maternity leave with my first child, I was three months pregnant with my second child. So (laughs) we had a really quick turnaround. My kids are about a year apart. And I went back to work and I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to slow things down. This is going to be so terrible. And when I got back, I realized for me, I just didn't care that much. Now, did I still want to get promoted? Yes. But did I want to do it at the sacrifice of my family? Absolutely not. I was no longer interested in that. And so I think there is a shifting of priority for many women, not for all, but for many women that when you have kids, the career is still important, but it's not the most important in my experience. Now, if it is still your most important, then you're going to need support systems. So this is kind of the last big thing that we'll touch on in this episode. But um, I volunteer at a charity called Mary's Home. They are partnered with Dream Center. So if you want to donate, I will put the link in the show notes. Um, I'm incredibly passionate about this nonprofit because they focus on women and children who are surviving domestic abuse. And they get them back on their feet. They provide living, education. They help them get their GEDs. They teach them how to make a resume, prep for interviews, find a job they love. And it's a true rehabilitation program for these people who are exiting unhealthy homes so that they can build healthy homes for themselves and their family in the future. And I'm really, really passionate about it because as someone who has a really supportive home structure, shit is still hard. (laughs) Okay. It's still hard. I work a full-time job. I run a full-time business. I used to teach fitness classes on top. I have since retired that portion of my time. I competed for Mrs. Colorado a month ago. So I was doing pageants and nonprofit events and community engagement. I volunteer at Mary's home and I have two children under 10 and a spouse who would preferably like to spend some time with me and my own hobbies like coloring and going in the garden. And it is hard to manage it all right now. I, as I mentioned earlier, have a very high tolerance for stress. I have a very high tolerance for the amount of things I can have weighing on me mentally without breaking. Not everybody does. So if you're listening to this and you're like, oh my gosh, there's no way I could do all that. Maybe you can't. And that's okay. You should be operating at a level that feels comfortable to you. I operate at this level pretty naturally. And I think that gets a bad rep because people will say, oh my gosh, it comes so easy to you. But this is like a learned practice over a long period of time. And it is something that comes somewhat naturally to me. And comparing yourself to other people, this is where comparison becomes such a trap is if you're comparing yourself to someone who's doing all these things, you feel like you're not enough. Again, you are, but also you have no idea what their life has looked like, what they're they've been through how they're coping, right? Like I don't meditate well, my brain does not slow down. It just doesn't do it. And so meditation for me is like really, really stressful. And I look at these people who can like meditate and do yoga and they're so like at peace with themselves. And I think that's great. And I struggle like hell with that, right? So don't compare yourself to other people. But getting back on topic with support systems, with all that I do, so much of it is made possible because my husband is incredibly supportive. I'm just being honest. He gets involved in a lot of places where a lot of husbands don't. Not trash talking husbands. There are plenty of great husbands out there. I'm just saying in general. And that facilitates my ability to do a lot of things. When you are in a situation where you do not have a support system. So maybe that's that your partner is not very involved. Maybe it's that your boss is not very understanding of the requirements you have as a mom. Maybe it's that... You don't have any parents or in-laws to watch the kids on weekends for date nights. Maybe it's that you don't have friends who are parents who get what it's like to be a parent, or you don't have friends who are parents and have a corporate job. They don't understand what that stress level is like. There are so many ways that your support system can be lacking. And this isn't to say that any of those people are bad. But what I will tell you is if you are a mom and you are trying to do it all, you're trying to do the corporate job, you're trying to start the side hustle, you're trying to be the mom, you're on social media, you're doing all the things, 
you have got to have a support system in place. It is the number one priority. When you think of your support system, there's plenty of quotes and studies that show like you are a combination of the five people you spend the most time with, right? I think we've all heard that many times. What I would tell you to focus on is you need a friend who gets it, right? When I became an entrepreneur, I told uh, the first guest ever on my podcast, Tiffany Human, and she and I are still good friends to this day. I told her, I said, I'm not quitting my job until I know for sure I have a support system of entrepreneurs who get it because I can't do this by myself. Being an entrepreneur is too isolating and I know myself, I need that support system. So I built a community. I didn't build it. Diana YK Chan brought me into it, but a community of entrepreneurial women, moms, spouses who get it, right? You need that group. You also need the time support, right? Is that a nanny? Is that people who clean your house? Is that a spouse who's really involved? Is that um, in-laws who live nearby? Is that a great babysitter you can lean on? Like you're going to need time support with your family. You need to build that up. And then the last one is that like romantic and intimate support. And in my opinion, the number one most important thing, and I am prefacing this by saying I am not a marriage counselor or a marriage therapist or a couples counselor, and I don't have any experience in that whatsoever. I've been married for like uh, 11 years now to the same person and take that for what you will. I think the number one most important thing in any relationship is communication, healthy, open, collaborative communication, being able to tell your partner what you need and then being willing to give it to you and vice versa. So there are plenty of places where this is really, really challenging. I feel incredibly blessed, incredibly lucky that the partner I ended up with wanted to be involved with our kids, wanted to be supportive of me, wanted me to chase my dreams. Like he is my number one fan all the time. And I'm really, really thankful for that. You need that. Okay. There is no way to do all the things and not have this. And this requires that open communication. Maybe it requires couples therapy or marriage therapy. There's, if you don't have the intimate relationship, the time support, and then the people who get it in your life, you are making your life 10 times harder. And that's just the end of it. So make sure that you're building that support system. There have been times in my life where I have lacked one of those three at any given time. And those are the periods of my life that I look back on with the most struggle, with the most frustration, with the most difficulty, because things were so much harder than they had to be. Right. So I think we've touched on a lot of different things related to motherhood and the workplace. And what I want to leave everybody with today, whether you are um, a husband listening to this, a spouse listening to this, a partner listening to this, a mom listening to this, there are a lot of pressures on us from all different directions. It is normal to feel like you're letting things drop in one area, but it's important for you to learn that you are worthy of the things you are getting. You are enough for the people in your life and that you deserve the love and the support that you need to be successful. And then build your support structures with that in mind, knowing that you're going to need them. And then give yourself some grace. All right. I told you guys at the beginning yesterday, I had a mental breakdown about not being a good mom. Seemed like a really good time to record a Mother's Day episode. All right. This morning I woke up and my book is officially at the publisher. And I was like, super imposter syndrome. Are people even going to buy my book? Do I even know what I'm going to say? Am I even going to add enough value? It is okay to have doubts, have your support system in place for when those doubts arise and know that I am always here. I'm rooting for you. I think you're great, even if we've never met. Okay. Um, but for any moms out there, from me to you, happy Mother's Day, I'm wishing you a day of all the things that fill your cup and help you feel satisfied and feel like you're doing all the right things. And we will see you guys back here next week for another great episode.